Hello, friends. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. I'm your host, James Dice. Each week, I fire questions at the leaders of the smart buildings industry to try to figure out where we're headed and how we can get there faster without all the marketing fluff. I'm pushing my learning to the limit, and I'm so glad to have you here following along. This episode is a conversation with Dana Guernsey, Chief Product Officer at Voltus. Dana is an energy markets expert at the forefront of integrating commercial and industrial distributed energy resources into electricity markets across the United States. We talked about how platforms like Voltus are filling the gap between portfolios of buildings on one side and the electricity markets on the other. Each has its own complexity and Voltus is out to smooth that away for building owners in order to capture the value of each building's demand flexibility. Definitely check out Dana's bold take on where building grid interaction is headed in the not too distant future too. Without further ado, please enjoy the Nexus podcast with Dana Guernsey. Hello, Dana. Welcome to the show. Can you introduce yourself? Hey, James. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'm Dana Guernsey and I am Chief Product Officer at Voltus. All right. I'm so excited to to have you on. Can you start by giving us a little background? What did you do before Voltus? I'll start at the top. So I studied mechanical engineering at Dartmouth for both undergrad and grad. Okay. And I think that was when I first found my way to the like environmental mission side of the power sector, which I don't think was obvious at the time. And so I had this unique chance to come at it from the angle of how can we make this work cool as the college kids do, I guess. But it was right around the time when the Prius was gaining traction Okay. And if you, if you recall, it was more or less just like egg on wheels and definitely had a stigma of not being high performance. So as an engineering student, we were afforded this choice to do a culminating experience project. <clears throat> Excuse me. I worked on a project converting an old formula student race car into a hybrid. Oh. And so, it, yeah, so it appealed to me immediately because it was, if a race car could be green and outperform the traditional internal combustion engine cars, then maybe the whole industry could see that being green or clean was actually better on all fronts, which of course is what Tesla has now done. So I like to yeah. joke, I like to not joke I was ahead of my time because this was 2006 prior to when the Roadster came out in 08. So I feel like maybe Elon doesn't give me enough credit, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, so I was realizing then what a fascinating space clean tech was. I heard about this company, Enernock, which many of uh, your listeners are probably familiar with. It's now NLX. And I was drawn to the business model innovation of Enernock. It wasn't a new invention. It was just a new way of doing old things. And I'd never heard of paying customers to use less energy. And I just thought it was super cool and something I wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So that was like the beginning. I, I then stayed there for seven years. I led eventually their whole international energy markets group. And I think just through that time, I realized how interesting of a problem space the power sector was. The electric grid itself, right? I think it's been called this like greatest feat of the 20th century, which is very valid in my book, the level of complexity, the magnitude of the markets, the fragmentation of the markets. We talk about balkanized markets and this responsibility to keep the lights on keep the economy going. It's too big to fail. And yet I, I bet most people just go through their day not thinking twice about the, the privilege that it is to just on demand with relatively no bounds, use as much electricity as they want in their homes and their businesses. And they definitely don't think about like the systems and markets and how supply and demand need to be perfectly balanced, save for some energy storage every minute. So it's pretty wild. All of this to say, I think the power sector and clean tech at large are this opportunity to do well by doing good. And if the 20th century grid was already a feat of modern engineering, then the 20, we're sure in for something with the 21st century grid, it's probably just gonna be this like jaw dropping metamorphosis and the whole thing. Cause we're at this inflection point with 21st century technology that's all here. And then this like really, really aging old some set of infrastructure and we should come back to that point like just the current state of the grid so so that was that was how the passion spark and how i ended up in this space super briefly after enernock i joined a battery storage startup called ambry that which is developing a new type of 
long duration uh, grid scale storage. Storage, I was drawn to, again, it was just this other side of the grid grid services and transactive grid space compared to the more traditional flavor of demand response at the time, this was 2014. So I spent a few years there and ultimately they were a little earlier on in the commercialization process than what I was looking for. And so I found my way back to distributed energy resources more broadly via Voltage. All right. Yeah, I was on the phone with Pierre Lafarge, who you might know as CEO of Spark Fund a couple of weeks ago, and he called, you know, the expectation of always on electricity. He called it provision of clicky, like the lights, <laughs> light switch. People just want the, the power to come on when you flip the light switch. And that, that phrase has been like sticking in my head. Provision. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. People take it for granted, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't think about it. You just turn your light switch on or your blow dryer or your production line, whatever it is. Totally. All right. So tell me about Voltus. What is, what is Voltus? What is Voltus? All right. Well, so in one sentence, Voltus is a technology platform that connects distributed energy resources to electricity markets in return for cash. So we somewhat literally plug energy things into energy markets for the purpose of earning money for our customers while also creating a more resilient and flexible grid. And so this might be a good chance if you want to like zoom out to the big picture for a moment. We've yeah. got this aging antiquated grid. It's old. It was built for a different world where there were centralized power plants and they sent power kind of just in one direction out, right? And so fast forward, it's, that's not the case anymore. More and more things are moving to the grid edge, to the distribution piece of it that actually delivers the power to homes and businesses. Then you layer in like climate stress and climate emergencies. And then you layer in the fact that we need to accommodate the higher and higher penetration of renewables and electric vehicles and the grid, that it, it's at its brink, right? So that's the problem statement. And then on the flip side, if you want to talk like the solution or what do we do about it, we do have these abundant and cheap renewables, which are awesome. Solar prices and wind prices have come way down. We have 21st century technology and IT and computing powers. And we have thousands and thousands of existing assets that aren't being utilized as efficiently as they could be. The analogy I give sometimes is Airbnb. So <laughs> Airbnb's platform, you used to have all of these existing apartments or houses. And when you weren't using them, nothing came of it. And now you have a platform, Airbnb, where you can monetize them. So, so similar with DERs, there are all these resources out there, whether it's a physical office building that might have operational flexibility, whether it's HVAC controls in a commercial property or production lines in a, in a manufacturing facility or the Nest thermostat in your home or the Nissan Leaf charging your garage. Like these are energy assets, but we don't, it's not their primary job. It's almost like it's a side gig for them to be grid services or grid transactive. Mm -hmm. And so they need, they need a platform that they can plug into that removes all the complexities of how those transactions connect, but that when they're not performing their primary use case, it can help support the grid as an existing resource. And so what we've done at Voltus is we've built a cloud-based technology platform to orchestrate all of this. We've kind of the connective tissue of that. Got it. And what's, what's your role? So you came from the mechanical engineering background. What, what, what's your role at the company? So I lead our product group and so behind the scenes, it's a ton of complicated product that we're building, which is, which is where our job comes in. So we want to make the platform very, very simple for our customers. And the reason that that's a need is because what we're doing is actually very, very, very complex. These markets are fragmented. Each one is its own snowflake. It's non-trivial to bring simplicity out of that chaos. So the product team is defining our product offering, scoping out exactly what it is that we need to build. Uh, I have an energy markets group in my organization as well that manages all of the distributed energy resource portfolios and market participation. They're truly the 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 energy affectionately, you know, the energy nerds who know everything about how the energy the energy markets work and create those commercial offerings based on how it kind of works behind the scenes with the you know eight hundred to seven thousand page tariff. And uh, yeah, so they're in the thick of it day to day. We're also working on new partnership offerings as we continue to build the company and like 
push the frontier of what DERs can do with, with participation in these markets. Got it. Got it. Very cool. Yeah, when 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 you say platform, you actually mean it. I think there's like a little bit of an epidemic in the smart buildings world when people say platform, they're not actually. And I've ranted about this in the podcast before. People will stop beating a dead horse about this, but you're actually connecting a bunch of customers and their DERs on one side of the platform with all of the different energy markets and abstracting away the complexity on both sides for both players in the marketplace. So when you say platform, that's what you're talking about. That's right. You just nailed it. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we do. All yeah. right. And, so, and do folks have an understanding of like what the, I'm assuming folks have an understanding of what the ERs are. Yeah. So, we, okay. Yeah. If, if this is their first episode, I'll just talk to them. You can refer back to the show notes and we'll have our, all everything else we've done on DERs. People can uh, go deeper if they want to, but it's essentially just any, any device that can be connected that has some sort of demand offering that it can provide to the grid. Is that a, is that a fair definition? Yeah, I would actually expand on that just a tiny bit. I'm going to, I'm going to use the FERC categories. So FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which everyone probably knows well, but there's four key categories. So there's there's demand response, which is really flexible load. And so it doesn't need to be a device to be a flexible load or what we call demand response. There's distributed generation, and that's increasingly like where all the microgrid development is happening and lots of talk about resiliency and reliability. There's energy storage, which includes electric vehicles, which at the end of the day are batteries on wheels. In, from, a, from a grid services perspective. Mm -hmm. And actually energy efficiency is a DER and can be monetized in wholesale markets as well as capacity. It, it, it serves the same use case as say like base load capacity because you're right. just clipping off the bottom of that stack, the amount of energy that's needed. So those four things make up DERs. And if you want to wonk out for a second, the, so last fall, I think probably folks have heard of this, but last fall, the major ruling for the industry came out of FERC about DERs order 2222 or 2222 or two by four. And that's really paved the way for all these DER types to aggregate and compete against traditional resources in the organized wholesale markets. And in essence, it, it blows open the doors all at once for these assets to have unencumbered access to the markets and FERC has directed the markets to pay for them for their services. So now your Nest or Honeywell thermostat in essence can compete right alongside an aging coal plant. And if you get enough of them together, they form a virtual power plant, which is another you know, word thrown around, which, which basically is just an aggregation of DERs that can directly displace the traditional power plant, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And I'll also put in the show notes, we did a, we do this ongoing series called The Lens taking whatever happens in the news and dissecting it, what it means for, for building people. And I did a, I did a version on FERC 2222. So put that Great. in the show notes as well. This does matter to you behind the meter people. And that's why we're digging it into it today. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that's pretty obvious. So tell me about the ways in which a building owner, let's kind of frame it uh, from their perspective, might uh, enroll in, in what you guys do. So any building owner, has some form of operational flexibility. They might also have behind the meter devices, be it smart thermostats or building management systems or any sort of other flexible load control. Any of those can be aggregated through our platform or through other DER providers offerings and sold to the wholesale market. They're sold to the wholesale market the same way that a power plant would sell their megawatts. So the, the consumption of power or the reduction in consumption on the part of these buildings can get paid by the wholesale market operators the same way a power plant would. So just to give you like a very specific example, let's say you are a commercial real estate property, you're a building in New York City, mm -hmm. and you're using probably a typical building use five megawatts of power. Rule of thumb, probably 10 to 20% of that is flexible when it comes to the programs that they might participate in in New York. It's roughly $300,000 per megawatt per year for that flexibility. So say one out of the five megawatts is the flexible part of that building, either through a building management system or some other sort of behind the meter control. That's worth $300,000. And that's what we do is we help those businesses tap into that 
we get paid by the market operator as if we were a power plant and we share some of that uh, payment with the, with the end customer. Makes total sense. So does this apply? Tell me about where this applies geographically and then types of buildings, sizes of buildings, different types of businesses. Where, where does this apply? Well, geographically, I mean, there's a whole international world of this and every system has an energy market that that the physics level of it is run in the same way. There's capacity, there's energy, there's ancillary services. We'll focus on North America. That's where the Voltus footprint is. So we are in every one of the nine organized wholesale markets today in North America. And any facility, again, I go back to any facility that has some sort of flexibility or control or behind the meter DER can participate. And that goes all the way up to huge steel manufacturing plants, down through commercial real estate properties and pools and wastewater treatment plants and retailers, big box stores, all the way down through your home. And so all of those, all of those types of things and all of those businesses distributed energy resources when you think about it. And so what we're doing is we're just equipping them to act as such and then plugging them into the market to get paid for that. Okay. So what does a typical project look like? And maybe you could talk about like, is there, is there certain case studies that people can kind of hang their hat on successful case studies? So as a platform, any project that we do usually has two sides of it. So I'll give you an example of something that was new for us on both sides. So last year we became the first distributed energy resource aggregator in STP, the Southwest Power Pool, which covers something like, I don't know, 16, 17 states in the center of the country. And we became a market participant to provide what's called operating reserves, which every market needs. Operating reserves are procured for the reason that there needs to be a balancing backstop to the day-to-day, minute-to-minute fluctuations on the grid. We talked about the grid being balanced every second. Of course, there are slight imbalances. And so balancing resources or operating reserves address that. They get used a couple of times a month on average, and they're relatively short in duration. They're just these like quick fixes. Okay. So we became a market participant in Southwest Power Pool. One of our many customers is a national big box retailer. And so at the same time, we were standing up a fully loaded end-to-end integration with them. And so we enabled all their facilities in the SPP footprint to automatically respond to these grid events by changing their HVAC set points. Okay. And it's all an end-to-end signal from SPP to Voltus, all in real time to these stores and back again. We're streaming these dispatch signals and telemetry. And if you were you were standing in the store, you would never notice it because they're such they're so short okay. uh, in duration. And SPP is is uniquely in need of this because there's so much wind capacity there, and wind is intermittent, and we can't tell the wind when to blow or the sun when to shine. And so, in order to have these higher and higher renewable penetration levels, you also need to have more and more flexible load and more and more operating reserves. So that was a project we were proud of in, in SPP last year. Okay. So I'm standing in Best Buy and I'm like looking for my new TV and the thermostat just shifts a couple of degrees on the set point. Is that it? That's it. And you would never know because this is like the thermal mass of that Best Buy in that example. And, and given how short in particular these are in duration, you can turn the whole HVAC system off for 10 minutes and no one would notice. Got it. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, one, no one would notice. And, and so you can actually get like a whole lot of juice out of those types of programs when you're talking HVAC control. We also serve retail stores like that in longer duration programs, what are called capacity programs or, or emergency, they'll, and you know, they'll be two to four to six hours in nature. And for that, we'll set back the set points, but just not as aggressively. So you'll set it back a couple degrees. And again, no one really notices, but in aggregate, that can have a huge impact. Totally. And what's the, the tech stack look like? Are these, it probably depends on what's installed, but I guess if they have a connected thermostat, you can connect to that remotely. If there's more of like a building automation system, you might have to have something local, like a gateway. How does, how does that process work integrating with these systems? We have a set of external APIs. So if there's an existing system, anyone who's gotten an existing building management system, we can connect directly to that. If they don't have that, we can install a hardware device. We call it our Voltlet. And that effectively sits on top of the utility meter counting pulses. Okay. And 
a pulse most simply is just this, um, it it's a change of state and it's a counter and it represents the amount of energy that has gone past the meter. Do you imagine those like circular meters, the utility meters? So if you're counting pulses, you can translate that into how much energy is consumed by the customer on an interval basis. And so we actually install our voltlet and we can collect 30 second interval meter data that we then stream to our cloud-based platform and can show our customers in real time. So one of the other benefits that, that folks get out of it is, is simply the access to their data. Yeah. And they can do all sorts of energy saving things with that and alerts on, on high demand days and, and you name it. Okay. And then what about to the HVAC system? Does the Voltlet then connect into the BMS? Is that how that works? Yeah, it can either be done through the Voltlet or through some APIs, depending on, really depending on what the customer wants. Our, our okay. team will work with, with whatever they, their preferences. Got it. And then how, how about, how does the monetization work then? What, how, how does the customer pay or get paid? This is where it gets even more fun because we pay our customers by and large. And so the way it works, you know, most simply is each megawatt will generate some dollar value figure per year, call it $50,000 per year. A portion of, so, so that comes the cash flow that comes to Voltus and we share a portion of that with our customer. And so we're in the business of actually paying our customers, which is like a mind shift you have to get around because we're getting paid as if we were a power plant by the grid operators, and then we're paying our customers to participate. So from a, you know, why do this perspective? Well, it's because we're gonna pay you and you don't have to do anything. There's no upfront costs. We make it very simple, starting with a one page agreement and keep it like really layman's terms because we get it that customers are not in the business of managing energy, right? They, that, that's our business. The customers are in the business of managing their business and energy is this afterthought and yet it can be a huge expense. And so. If we can help them reduce that expense by literally paying them, it, it gets their attention. And so that's how we go to market and that's how we, that's how it works in terms of paying the customers. Cool. And you, you're saying this applies in other countries besides the U S too. There's a huge, pretty, not huge. There's a, there's a big fault nexus following in APAC and Europe as well. And I think one of the current concerns I always have talk about FERC and talk about, you know, local markets. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm assuming this is coming to them too. Is, it, is that right? Yes. In fact, it's, it's already there. So Japan, the market, I think they've committed to procure something like four gigawatts of DERs by 2024. Don't hold me to that. Something like that. Korea is a market that's highly industrialized. Australia, certainly Europe, Germany, and, and other countries there. I, th I think the best way to answer that question is that we need to recognize the primary reasons for being for our customers or their devices. An example of the future would be that when every electric vehicle is also providing grid services, first and foremost, the electric vehicle needs to drive around this, you know, well, the driver might be driving it or the car might be driving the driver, whichever way you have it in the future. But the primary use case is that the owner needs to get from place A to B. And that's most important. And so we take that into account when we talk about buildings too. The primary function of the day is something we'll work out with our clients. If it's an industrial facility, for example, they might have a huge production run and that is their priority. And that's, that's okay. And that's part of the power of aggregation because it's always gonna be somebody's day where they just really need to opt out. Hmm. And okay. option value is really important we need to be able to give people that option value within reason. And that's where our sales team and our customer success team come into play because there's this real human element of it. We need to understand what motivates the customer and we need to work with them to create a curtailment plan that works. Uh, it doesn't work if we're disrupting their business, right? Our incentives are very aligned. We want them to be able to earn money so we can all share in it. So from the very beginning, taking the time to understand by industry vertical, what those needs are and what type of curtailment plan works or doesn't work. You know, it works to change HVAC settings a couple degrees for a few hours. We know this to be true. It works when prices are high enough to send people home for the day and not make the widgets. We know this to be true. And so we, we turn it into a very straightforward, compelling economic opportunity. Hmm. Is it worth it? 
is it worth X dollars per hour to you to do Y? And we really make it formulaic for them because again, in the, for, we're dealing with businesses. And, and so we get right down to the economics of it so that we're not doing anything other than giving them the best economic outcome. That makes sense. That re- reminds me of kind of like the old, old days of demand response, not like a device driven demand response, but like whole building you know, control system driven demand response. You have like a program that you press play on and someone has to like design that, right? I've done several of those control sequences where when, when it's time, we press this button right here and then right. these, and things happen, right? Right, right. Alarm bells, yeah, this button. And, and it, yeah, and there's versions of that for every type of DER. There's, you got to define the primary use case. So one more example would be, let's say you've got a solar plus storage installation, mm-hmm. let's call it behind the meter or wherever you want to be. Probably the reason that that resource was developed was to help offset demand charges and cycle daily to make the most use out of the solar. They're probably looking at the ITC. There's probably all sorts of reasons where you've got to understand why was that asset put there to begin with. And then you can realize, okay, well, like overnight, that asset's not doing anything. So maybe we can help it generate a higher return for its owner because overnight, there's actually still good services value. And so you really have to be able to Tetris that together in order to make it work for the customer and to make it simple for them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do is we have a very simple like scheduling interface where folks can just tell us I'm available, I'm not available, like always keep me out during these hours of the day, whatever it is, and we can work with that. And then at the portfolio level, you can, you know, as it gets big enough, the flywheel effect starts to come into play because now you've got this like bigger thing, even though it's very mixed in terms of its composition, it actually becomes even more powerful because you don't just have one thing, like it's a portfolio. Totally. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that it's not like, there's no illusions of this being like perfectly automated and like cookie cutter. It sounds like it's like what the building industry really would need, which is like you're, you're engaging a certain stakeholder in their day-to-day jobs, right? And you're tailoring the solution to that building's needs and the outcomes that they're trying to enable essentially. Exactly. And we've got accounts where the needs at the corporate level even can vary from the needs at like the building level. And so we'll work with those building chief engineers to make sure that at the building level, they're also bought into the strategy. Because again, if they're not, then like it doesn't work. But then when you show them the economics, you start and complete by showing them the money. So it's very Jerry Maguire to show them like, it, like it just, it really just grounds people in why are we doing this? And then you get their attention. And then you can also explain, well, there are these reliability benefits. And we look at what happened just recently. We've had all of these environmental climate crises between wildfires in California and blackouts last August and Uri, winter storm Uri wiping out Texas in February. And even just Ida, I think there are people, there are people, Louisiana still doesn't have all its power back on. And so it's also very front of mind that there's a resiliency component here to DERs as well. And as you get deeper and deeper into those conversations, I like to think it becomes more and more of a no-brainer. Nice. Very cool. Hey guys, just another quick note from our sponsor, Nexus Labs, and then we'll get back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Nexus Foundations, our introductory course on the smart buildings industry. If you're new to the industry, this course is for you. If you're an industry vet but want to understand how technology is changing things, this course is also for you. The alumni are raving about the content, which they say pulls it all together. And they also loved getting to meet the other students on the weekly Zoom calls and in the private chat room. You can find out more about the course at courses.nexuslabs.online. All right, back to the interview. So how about the other side of the marketplace? For people that don't know how the, the, the nuances to that piece, what are the kind of sort of keys to success to sort of aggregating or I think of it more like abstracting away the complexity of monetizing that flexibility that you're creating. You mean on the wholesale market side? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, like when I, when I brag about our team, I think it's, it's always twofold. It's that we have this extraordinary tech talent and we also have extraordinary energy market expertise. Got it. You need folks who are energy market experts. You need folks who understand the tariffs, who live and breathe them, who follow their evolution, who, who, who just know it 
And then you also need though the technology and the platform capabilities to actually connect to these markets. Because as you get into these more sophisticated products, the, the, the ER is 2.0 and 3.0, and it's not just those emergency programs, it's all the time, this, this, the ancillary services type functions. You, the grid operators expect that you are streaming them real-time telemetry and that you can't just do that with you know, what the utility meter does. And they expect that you can receive their dispatch signals in real time and send back to them how your resource is performing just the same way that a single power plant would. Hmm. And so the technology layer there mixed with the energy market expertise to actually manage that portfolio is where it becomes so important on like that other side of, you know, the other, not the DER side, the actual market side. Totally. Yeah. And then you have to do that for each market separately because each one, it's like they're so fragmented and different. And it's, they sometimes even pride themselves on, you know, we'll mention, oh, well, well PJM or KISO does it this way. And well, we're very different from PJM or KISO for X, Y, or Z reasons. And it's, it's like not even relevant. So if I could wave one magical regulatory wand, it would be to have single market design. That's not the case. And so each time we do, and this is, this is why, we believe we run into different competitors actually in different markets because it's so hard to span them all. Totally. Yeah. And, and obviously this audience is a lot more familiar with the complexity on the building side. Every, every building's different. Every building owner's different, you know, every procurement. Uh... Yeah. It's the same thing. It's, it, that's a perfect parallel, James, because you could say all of that and then just talk about the markets themselves and the products within those markets. Yeah, and that's why it's so exciting you guys doing it kind of on both sides. And that's why it's such a difficult problem as well. It's probably highly, highly interesting every day. So you mentioned like the other ways to approach this problem, other aggregators. Can you talk about like, we've had others on the podcast that have done similar things. Can you talk about how you guys approach the problem differently than other, other sort of aggregator or other platforms? Yeah, um, let's see. So I think we're unique in that we're able to serve DERs on a national scale with a single platform. So for many of our customers that do have that national footprint, they don't necessarily want to work with different providers in different markets. They certainly don't want to do it themselves. And so there's no one else right now that I'm aware of that can offer a single connection point to all of the North American electricity markets hmm. through, through their platform. So that's, that's one. I, I think another one is that some of our biggest competitors at their core to take an LX, for example, they're energy service energy services companies. They're not necessarily built as a tech company, so they don't. It's just a different DNA. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I, I hope. I mean, every we need everybody to be successful in this space. So the answer here is more just about how I view Voltus as competitively different. And but certainly, there's I would hope space for everybody. Totally. The the thing I'm wondering about this space is like from the building owner's perspective, and maybe there's no answer to this, there could be, but like, why should they care, right? And, and most of the reasons that I usually come up with, and I think that aligns with what we've talked about so far is like, they care because I'm going to pay you something <laughs> to provide this, this benefit, right? And, and what I've always wondered and, and have been wondering is like, is that payment enough to get anywhere near the top of their priority list. Is that, is that a big challenge with like, yes, we're going to pay you and you should pay attention. Like how, how does it, how do you guys get building owners to kind of show up and, and pay attention and care? Look, I'm, the simplest answer is that for the most part, it does make that cut. And okay. by layering in a lot of different program offerings, hmm. it helps get us there too. So we talk about program stacking and so understanding where you can and can't do that and how you, where you might stack versus weave, I like to say. Sometimes okay. you, can, you can be in multiple programs, but just like not in the exact same hour. But look, there are also customers who just say, nope, what I do is more valuable than that and it's not worth my time. And that's why we lead with the money. We really try to get to that answer quickly and then move on because it's, you know, it's not for 100% of the buildings out there, but I do think it's the vast majority of them that could benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Just one more, let's just, uh, just one more thing on that last point. I think when you then layer in a lot of customers are starting to have ESG goals and mm -hmm. metrics and talk to them about the impact of what they're doing, 
that they're adding to the reliability, they're reducing the carbon footprint of the grid, of their building. And then you start talking resiliency. Wouldn't you prefer to be alerted when the grid is about to blackout and paid to curtail rather than not know it was happening and just get your power shot off anyway? Like <laughs> we used to talk about that and people used to say, well, that will never happen. And you're just saying that to, you know, make you sign up for your, your program or whatever. And, but, but that's no longer, we're no longer met with that answer after California and Texas of late. So resiliency and the focus on microgrid development is a real thing. And if you're going to do that, you should also be thinking about grid services. Totally. So is where we're headed with this, you know, like when 2222 gets fully enforced throughout the country, I was going to ask, I was going to lead you, but I, I want to ask you kind of where are we headed with this? You know, we start to talk about resiliency and carbon intensity of the grid in real time. Like, where are we headed with this? Where, where will the average building be when this is, this is fully implemented, however many years in the future? Oh boy. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> all right, listen, we could do bold predictions. This is fun. All right, so, so like, I believe we could have a 100% carbon neutral grid. And if we have that, then like, the marginal cost of energy is not relevant anymore, which means you need to reimagine wholesale market structure altogether and think a lot about load flexibility and this resource orchestration, right? It's gonna totally upend what we know as our model today. And so I think distributed energy resources and, and, and specifically grid transacted buildings are gonna be very much at the heart of that you're gonna need an operating system or a, a platform to, to allow them to do that. And that's what we're building at Voltus. But then you're each, yes, and just each building, I think they're gonna just be much more in tune with energy and energy usage. I think they'll probably all have EV charging networks and you'll see much more microgrid development and probably someone at every building whose job it is to make sure that they're thinking about this. Hmm. And I just think that like, uh, I don't know if it's three years from now or five years or 10 years, that this will all just be much more ubiquitous. I like bold predictions. Yeah. So what, what have we missed so far? I like to ask this question or near the end when I don't know what I don't know. And so like, what, ha what haven't I asked uh, about yet? By, by the year 2030, a statistic that might be relevant is that the combined lithium ion battery capacity of electric vehicles in the US will be more than twice the combined capacity of central power stations. So we take all the coal, natural gas, nukes, hydro, et cetera, in the US, multiply it by two, and that's what will exist in American garages by the year 2030. Whoa. So when we talk about like the direction of where we're going and just where and how load is gonna shift from this very centralized model that we've had to date, it's gonna to totally change it. Like the system was originally built to adjust supply to meet demand. Everything about it was built that way. The market design, the physical infrastructure. And so now we're evolving it to also adjust demand to meet supply. Like supply is becoming more and more intermittent. And demand is becoming more and more flexible. And so the whole thing's just getting upended. And I think for, for building owners, they can't just close their eyes and not realize that like the building is very much part of that. Yeah. And that doesn't include all of the behind the meter batteries. That just includes cars. You're saying. Yeah. That's just cars. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and not to discount the behind the meter batteries, I'm like looking out over this parking lot right now and all the cars that are just sitting there all day, pretty much. Right. So yeah. Wow. That, that yeah. definitely and, like puts it in perspective for sure. Yeah. And, I think, I guess one other thing just to talk about is I just also think we're at this inflection point of people caring about this. Yeah. Like it has become a dinner table topic in a way that it hasn't just over the last six to nine months. You know, I think it started with the election cycle. Um, certainly some of the infrastructure bill planning helps, but also just this like cr climate crisis after climate crisis and grid blackout after grid blackout. People are, I have friends who, know nothing about energy sector calling and asking me questions hey like is what you do addressing what's happening right now in texas and then we get into these conversations and so it's also manifesting itself in terms of just the inbound of people who want to work on this we, we're getting we used to be concerned about competing for tech talent you know with like google and facebook and whoever and 
I think something like a third of our teams actually come from tech giants because people are just increasingly motivated to put their tech skills to work to, to totally. do something meaningful and be very mission oriented. So just like being in this space in general has never been more, it's just, it's felt, it's never felt like there was as much momentum as there is right now, at least for me. That's awesome. Well, thanks for painting this picture for us. I really appreciate it. Do you want to wrap up with two truths and a lie? Sure thing. I've been, I've been waiting for this moment to stump you, Jane. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. Now, now, you know, I put a lot of thought into like, is it more likely that the person puts the lie, the first, the second, the third? Oh, I'm not, I'm not, you should, you should track that data and let me know. Okay. I, I'm, I have about a sample size of 10, something like that. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So two truths and a lie. Here we go. So one, I own an electric vehicle. Okay. Two, I have driven on a NASCAR racetrack. And three, my house is entirely electric. I want to say the lie is the NASCAR racetrack, but I'm so uncertain. This is the most uncertain I've ever been. Is that your final answer? Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> I have driven on a NASCAR racetrack. We took our, our hybrid electric race car from my graduate program and we, we raced it. And so I was the it was the lightest on the team at the time being one of the only females. And so I got to drive it for an acceleration run. We went zero to 60 in four seconds. It was, it was awesome. You know, you told me enough about your background for me to have intuited that one. And so I, I'm kind of ashamed of, of my performance on this. All right. Well, you give another try. What's the other, what's the lie now? Your house is all electric. Oh man, that's true too. I, <laughs> I don't, my house is all electric. We converted. We're all electric, but I don't own an EV, and I would really like to. So I'm working okay. on that. All right, that has been a, that has been a truth or a lie on the podcast before. I can't remember who that was, but uh, oh. damn, I, I have only missed once, and the other one was what I feel like was a little bit of a cheap shot. You just went straight for it though, and I still I still failed. So <laughs> well done, well done. It's been fun. It's been fun. Well, thanks so much. This has been awesome getting to know you and Voltus. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, which, by the way, readers have said is the best way to stay up to date on the future of the smart buildings industry, please subscribe at nexuslabs.online. You can find the show notes for this conversation there as well. Have a great day. Thank you.